Okay, hello again, everyone. Welcome back to Great Texts, John Dewey's Art as Experience. And this week, we're going to be talking about Chapter 3, and that's having an experience. Um, okay, now, the ideas Dewey's been developing so far in the book really come to fruition in this chapter. And uh, we're going to get some of the central ideas for Dewey's theory of art and aesthetic experience on the table this time. The core distinction with which Dewey begins uh, the chapter is that between uh, experience at large and uh, what he calls an experience, right? So the, the idea is something like this. Um, experience in general is always going on. As long as you're conscious, you're having experience, right? You're experiencing. An experience, as uh, Dewey says, um, is an experience that forms a, a unified event that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, um, where um, goals and expectations are fulfilled, or there's a certain kind of um, uh, unity. Everything comes together. Everything's integrated in an experience. We can see this, this sort of difference in everyday, in everyday speech. Um, so we talked about, you know, what an experience I had, or um, that was a real experience. And, and there we're talking about um, something that is a kind of unified uh, event, right? Um, uh, you know, Angela Chase might say, we had a time, right? Um, that's not that different from saying, uh, you know, that was a real experience, right? Um, do we provide some examples that are non artistic in nature, like um, when, you, when you are working a problem and you solve it, uh, when you complete a game of, of chess or, or something similar, um, when you have a conversation that has a real sort of back and forth flow, um, when you finish writing something, these are all uh, examples, some of them very long uh, term um, of, of an experience, right? Um, that, you know, if you're writing a book, that's a very long experience, but it is, if you finish it uh, and you, you know, come to a happy, uh, sort of you're happy with the way it ends up, um, you're having an experience. Um, now, one of, the, uh, one of the features of experience that Dewey likes, likes to em emphasize is what we might call the unifying pervasive quality, or sometimes the immediate pervasive quality of an experience, right? Um, to, to quote Dewey, he says, the existence of this unity is constituted by a single quality that pervades the entire experience in spite of the variations of its constituent parts. Um, he says this unity is neither emotional, practical, nor intellectual. For these terms are names, uh, they, t they name distinctions that reflection can make within this larger unifying quality, right? And this quality is immediately, immediately felt part of the overall experience. So we think back to this philosophical picture that Dewey's been providing us. You have the live creature embedded in the world or an environment, their environment. Um, and you have this constant kind of back and forth interaction, um, equilibrium sort of falling into disequilibrium and then returning to equilibrium, uh, but not in a kind of purely cyclical way in an always kind of changing, evolving way. And that the sort of activities where there's this interaction between the creature and the world, um, they have this pervasive quality. And we might say that the pervasive quality doesn't inhere in any particular part of this interaction, but in the whole thing, what Dewey sometimes calls a, a whole situation. Right? So the whole situation is the, is the thing that has this pervasive quality. And we can talk about situations in concert with, uh, with experiences, with an experience. You have a, a situation. Dewey also here alludes to William James' notion of the stream of thought. Sometimes it's called stream of, the stream of consciousness. Right? And, and James's idea, uh, developed in his psychology of 1890, his principles of psychology, is that consciousness, unlike what some of the early modern philosophers and, and, uh, and other psychologists have told us, is not just a 
succession of discrete little bits uh, that we might call ideas or impressions, but a stream or a flow of thought. He resists the notion of a, of a bundle or train or chain of thoughts and instead sees these things as sort of, as sort of flowing qualitatively one to the other. Um, and, and Dewey very much, uh, very much accepts this Jamesian idea uh, and, and repeats aspects of it in this chapter. So uh, Dewey marks an important sort of transition moment in the chapter with this, uh, with this uh, passage. He says, I've tried to show in these chapters, um, the first two plus the first part of the third chapter, that the aesthetic is no intruder in experience from without whether by way of idle luxury or transcendent ideality, but that it is the clarified and intensified development of traits that belong to every normally complete experience. An emphasis is on complete here too in this, um, in this quotation. Every time we have an experience, it has an element of the aesthetic to it. Not necessarily something we would call a work of art or even an aesthetic experience per se, you know, we might focus on it as an intellectual or, a, or a, another kind of experience, the experience of playing a game, say. Um, but, but whenever you have that kind, of, that kind of unity, there's something of the aesthetic to it. Um, now, Dewey sort of, um, he provides this distinction between the artistic and the aesthetic as a kind of central um, aspect of his, of his thinking where the artistic has to do with um, the production of art, with activities of doing and making, right? And the aesthetic uh, has to do with um, perception of an artwork and appreciation of, of the artwork or the enjoyment um, of, of the work. Um, Dewey actually sort of um, bemoans the fact that there's no sort of ultimate category above these two, right? It, you know, what, is, what, com what includes both the artistic and the aesthetic? Well, that's the aesthetic, right? So, so we, he thinks we get confused actually by the, by the poverty of the English language to, to provide the sort of superordinate category of which artistic and aesthetic are um, the, t the two elements, the two key elements. Um, now, uh, what's key for Dewey is that the artistic and aesthetic, that's a distinction that we need to draw, but also these two things are, uh, can't be separated completely. They're, they're deeply connected to one another. Um, the artist in making art, right, um, perceives it, uses their aesthetic sensibility to evaluate it and refine it, right? Um, on the other hand, turning it around, the perceiver in appreciating the art um, supposes that there's an artist recruits their knowledge, if, uh, if any, of the production of uh, this work or other works like it or of art in general as part of the enjoyment of it, right? So, uh, and, and the more the perceiver understands about the things that were done or how they were made, um, the diff they're gonna have a different um, kind of, of aesthetic experience of it. So you can't, you can't sever the two um, and when you do both the art and the aesthetic experience uh, of it uh, suffer, right? Uh, to the extent that if we, if we learn some, that there is no artist, that there is no, no production process behind a work of art, um, it might, it might uh, really hamper our ability to uh, enjoy it, uh, you know, as, as, as such, aesthetically. Um, so this is a key, this, and the two sides of this distinction are going to be important as we move through later chapters and explore sort of different features of art. Now Dewey refers to several artists in the chapter. Um, I'm going to mention just two for now. Uh, first, Cezanne, right? Cezanne was a painter, French, uh, a post-impressionist, he's sometimes called, um, highly celebrated. Uh, he was he worked from the middle of the 19th century. Um, he died in 1906. Um, he did a lot of landscape type work. Uh, so this is an example of a, of a landscape painting. He was very influential on later 20th century uh, art. Um, so you can think of major early 20th century artists. There's a lot of influence, Picasso, for example. 
And Cezanne happens to be one of Dewey's favorite painters. Um, interestingly, also, Cezanne was a favorite of the French philosopher uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Um, and, you know, Dewey's emphasis on experience, Merleau-Ponty's emphasis on phenomenology, uh, embodied phenomenology. There's definitely some, some uh, uh, philosophical uh, simpatico relationship there. Um, but, uh, but, but for Dewey, Dewey brings up Cezanne in this connection, in this chapter, because he's an example, Dewey thinks, of a great artist um, uh, who is not also uh, a, a great technician in Dewey's terms. In other words, if you think about the technical um, skills of painting, Cezanne doesn't have them, or at least doesn't exhibit them in his paintings. Uh, uh, now Dewey contrasts Cezanne with uh, John Singer Sargent, um, who was a, a well recognized as a master of technical painting skills, painted landscapes, architectural uh, kinds of paintings, but also uh, was a was a sort of classic portrait artist. So you see examples of different kinds of art by Sargent here. Um, so so Dewey says he was a great. Um, master of the, the technical skills of painting, but not a great artist. Um, definitely in his time some, uh, and after, some critics of Sargent uh, called him out for a kind of superficiality. Now, I mean, the justness or, um, or, or not of the specific uh, praise for Cezanne, criticism for Sargent aside, I think we can see what Dewey's on about pretty easily, right? That, that the technical skill of of the artist um, and the artistry in crafting an aesthetic experience are not the same thing, right? And, and so that distinction is one that is particularly important to Dewey's theory. So that's all I really have for you today. I look forward to uh, reading your discussion posts and um, talking with you this evening about uh, the chapter. I think there's a lot of rich material in here that I didn't really touch on too much, but I uh, wanted to kind of orient you to some of the key themes, let you know some of the things that I found interesting, and uh, I look forward to finding out uh, what you think. So I will see you see you then, and then, uh, and then um, we'll be around next week for chapter four.